Welcome to the Bay Area Breast Cancer and the Environment Research Program. Today I'm going to tell you about Of Mice and Women, how we use models in order to better understand breast cancer risk in women. I am Mary Helen Barcelos-Hoff. I've been at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory for the last 20 years, and I'm what you call a mouse doctor. I study mice to better understand how cancer arises in women. The premise for this NIEHS-funded uh, program is that by better understanding fundamental aspects of breast biology, we can now develop specific molecular markers which identify an individual's risk of breast cancer and molecular targets that might provide us a strategy for chemo prevention. In consequence of that, we have biomarkers, which are uh, markers that we can use in a woman's visit to the doctor's office, something non-invasive, that again tell us more about her risk of developing breast cancer. And together, all of this information will ultimately lead us to the prevention of breast cancer. So, how do we do this? Why do we need models of breast cancer? Well, one of the problems is that we start off with about 10 billion or more normal cells. In this little cartoon, I've designated an epithelial cell, which is the target for breast cancer, and it has a nucleus, colored yellow in this case, just because it's a bright, shiny color, but it's meant to represent a normal sequence of DNA. A first event that we think occurs in cancer is initiation, which is the change in the genetic sequence of DNA that gives the cell a, a potential for becoming a breast cancer. However, that potential is not sufficient if the cell remains as a single event. Instead, we need to have that cell multiply several times, many, many times over, in a process that we call promotion. So during that expansion of the population, there still isn't a cancer yet because these cells still only have one molecular change. And we believe that in breast cancer, as in most cancers, there are multiple genetic changes that need to occur in order for the tumor to actually develop. This portion of the process is called progression, where we now have many different genetic changes in a population of cells. These genetic changes then give rise to the ability of these cells to acquire different behaviors, something that is restricted from events that actually help the cells escape the restriction of the normal tissue. So they begin to proliferate more and more and invade surrounding tissues or even move to distant organs. And then, under those conditions, we have clinical cancer. Now, in order to understand this, you have to appreciate that this is not a quick process. There's something between, um, as far as we can tell for breast cancers, on the order of several decades between the start and finish of this process. In order for us to uh, then dissect this process, we need models. And for most breast cancer projects, we use mice. So why mice? or rats, your preference, actually not your preference, but the scientist's preference, because each of these rodent models have characteristics that we can take advantage of in our experimental manipulation. So first of all, what's important about a mouse or a rat is that they're both mammals. Therefore, they have mammary glands. So that's important. Uh, secondly, Unlike the diversity of the human population, where we have a great variety of different genetic compositions, mice that have been in the laboratory for many, many, many generations become inbred and as a consequence have consistent genetic backgrounds that it helps us to now control for particular variables in the carcinogenic process. In addition, they're practical. They have short lifespans. On average, a, a laboratory mouse lives a couple of years. They're small, easy to house, and relatively inexpensive, which means that we can use a large number of them in order to study in a statistical fashion how frequently breast cancer occurs as a function of some manipulation. Now, one of the real benefits that have come to light in the last uh, decade or so is the ability to genetic engineer designer mice. These designer mice have specific genes knocked out, or we can replace mouse genes with human genes in a better order to better under, um, study them. And then some uh, more recent technology has allowed us 
to create mice with reporter genes. These are mice in which we can tell when a gene is active because we now have linked some kind of uh, detectable marker to that gene function. Here's an example that people are always kind of amused by, uh, a fluorescent reporter. So the fluorescent reporter that we use is actually the green fluorescent protein from jellyfish. And what we've done is insert it next to another gene so that it's regulated in the same fashion as the gene of interest. So an example of how this now allows us to study the mammary gland more readily is shown in this slide, where what you're actually seeing is a green fluorescent mouse, essentially. Here's the mouse skin, and what we've done here is anesthetize it so that we can actually look at the living mammary epithelium. The mammary epithelium, I'm going to tell you about in a few minutes, is composed of a ductile tree. And so what you're actually looking at here in the green are the mammary epithelium of this particular mouse. In addition, you can see the blood vessels, which are a little bit darker red. And if you zoom in, you can look at very specific events in this mouse, even things like the formation of cancer in certain regions of the mammary tree. So this is one of the advantages that we'd like to make the most of in our studies with um, mice. So are there very many similarities between the human and the mouse mammary gland? Uh, well, here we have just a typical kind of histological image of the human mammary gland, which has an epithelium, a basal uh, a layer of, of cells called myoepithelial cells, and a stroma. Here's the lumen of the tissue. Down here is the mouse mammary gland, and again we have an epithelium, a layer, a very fine layer. This is a lower magnification, so it's a little more difficult to discern the myoepithelium, the stroma, and in both cases, these tissues are embedded in a fat pad, so the adipose. So the normal function of the mammary gland is to make milk. Both humans and mice make milk. I can assure you I've once milked a mouse. Um, both uh, organisms are capable of many cycles of lactation, um, um, which is what we call the milk production phase of the mammary gland, and then growth and involution, growth and involution, that allows you to, uh, to in the case of, of mice, actually suckle 10 pups at a time. In the case of women, you're lucky if you only have to do two at a time. So both of the tissues depend on the signals from the ovaries and other hormone-producing glands of the the individuals. So in the case of a mouse mammary gland, we can manipulate the hormonal constituents of the animal so we can see how that impacts um, mammary development. And as I pointed out here, this is a high magnification of a cross section of a duct. Here's a, a transverse section of a duct. And what's important to recognize is that the cells are organized in what's called a ductal tree. It really does look like a tree with a trunk and secondary branches and tertiary branches. And off of those come the little uh, milk producing um, units called alveoli. So this ductal tree also importantly in all mammals develops after birth. So we can actually uh, schematize that in the following way. Here now we have an image of what it looks like in a very simplified cartoon fashion, uh, the mammary fat pad. I've indicated here just a marker for you, which is called the lymph node. Um, there are lymph nodes all over uh, the body and in particular in the mammary gland. And in, at the time of birth, there's just a little tiny epithelial bud. Under the hormones of puberty in both mice and in humans, that epithelial bud begins to grow out and fill the fat pad. So through the process of forming these little um, units called end buds that push their way into the adipose stroma until the gland has reached the edge of the stroma, at which point those end buds regress. Um, in an adult or mature gland, the fat pad is completely filled with this ductal tree. Under the hormones of pregnancy and uh, lactation, the gland further develops into a very complex, almost completely filled with epithelial cells that now make the milk. And then when the, the pup or the baby is weaned, then the gland involutes. 
So it's really a fascinating biological process to study. And one of the things that we know about breast cancer is when these events occur as important in determining the risk of the women for uh, developing breast cancer. So there's this whole life cycle that we need to understand in order to better understand the things that give rise to breast cancer. So what are the similarities between human breast cancer and rodent mammary cancer? Here we have actually a mouse um, hole mount of a small little cancer. Um, you can see it's kind of disorganized. Here's our nice ductal tree. Here's the cancer. Likewise, if you look in a human tissue, here's our nice ductal tree, and here's a small in situ cancer. So, I'm, so in this way, you can see that histologically, they're organized in very similar fashions. There are other similarities between these two um, different organisms in terms of the type of cancer they get. It depends on, as I mentioned earlier, the genetic susceptibility of that individual. Um, it also depends on signals from the ovaries. And we know this because if we remove the ovaries, not only do we get a very um, quiet gland, but we significantly reduce the incidence of breast cancer. And we know that in both humans and in mice, the frequency of developing cancer increases with age. So in that way, they're similar. Furthermore, we know that the frequency of breast cancer in humans is modified by these life events that I just described, the pregnancies and something external like radiation exposure can dramatically change the risk of developing cancer. And likewise, in mouse mammary uh, models and in rat models, we can show the similar kind of events, pregnancy and exposure to radiation or other carcinogens increases the development of cancer. Um, Furthermore, once you have the cancers, there are some similarities in terms of the way cells are organized and the, the particular proteins they express. Probably all are aware that the presence of estrogen receptor in a cancer is a very important prognostic indicator. And just as we have um, estrogen receptor positive breast cancers in women, we can also uh, have breast cancers in, or mammary cancers, I like, I prefer to say, um, in mice are, can either be estrogen receptor positive or estrogen receptor negative. And so having these kind of similarities let us now manipulate the model so that we can understand under what conditions do we get an ER positive or an ER negative uh, tumor to arise. Let's go back to that original thought, which is there's genetic susceptibility that uh, predisposes certain individuals to have a higher risk of developing cancer. Not an absolute certainty that they're gonna develop cancer, but a higher risk of developing cancer. So women different in their genetic susceptibility to cancer. One of the um, uh, genetic uh, changes that we know is associated with um, breast cancer are the BRCA, breast cancer associated genes. BRCA1 and BRCA2, which if mutated, give rise to a greater risk of developing breast cancer in those individual carriers. Um, likewise, we have different strains of mice. Strains are these inbred uh, lines of mice where we've just bred siblings to each other for generation after generation. And once we have these different strains, we can also compare their genetic susceptibility. And in doing so, we can then use those mice that have a greater propensity to develop breast cancer to track which specific genetic features associate with the breast cancer frequency. Tumors also have important changes in DNA. So one of the real keys to understanding a tumor is being able to identify those genetic sequence changes, those DNA sequence changes that we call mutations um, within a given tumor because they can provide a signature that indicate prognosis, but can also, these mutant gene products can also be the targets for therapy. So for example, Herceptin, is a therapy directed against women who have a mutation in their tumors.